Thank you. So, I'm Miriam Peña from Instituto de Astronomía, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And I'm very glad to be here. I thank the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. And um, I'm going to talk about planetary nebulae as clues or as tools for stellar nucleosynthesis and the evolution of abundance gradients. Planetary nebulae are these ionized envelopes around an evolved stellar nucleus, and great efforts have been devoted to analyze planetary nebulae in the Milky Way and in nearby galaxies. Galaxies in the local group and beyond have been surveyed with the largest telescope available searching for faint and further planetaries. Why these objects are so important? Because they are the most luminous phase of evolution of their host stars with luminosities of about 10 to the four solar luminosities. And much of its emission comes out in a few bright narrow lines, so they are easy to detect. They mark the end of the active life of about 90% of stars, those which initially had masses between one and eight solar masses, and we are calling them low intermediate mass stars, limbs. Uh, planetary nebulae are good tracers of their parent population, with, which are stars in the transition from red giant to degenerate white dwarf. They allow chemical and evolution studies of the parent galaxies. Also, planetary nebulae in external galaxies are useful for distant determination and for cosmology. In external galaxies, planetary nebulae appears stellar. Here I'm showing the case of Andromeda, more than 700 planetaries have been detected. And I'm showing just a particular section here in, to the left in blue. In blue are the planetary nebulae detected in this zone of Andromeda. And to the left, there are the H2 regions in red. And notice, for instance, how H2 regions delineate the spiral arms the spiral lamps in Andromeda, while planetary nebulae are, are more widely distributed. Well, I want to, check, to show a typical spectrum of a planetary, and, but uh, I suppose many of you know this, this very well. There are all these emission line, all this emission line uh, uh, in the spectrum. And the important thing is that all those lines the analysis of this spectrum provides the physical conditions, the chemical abundance of the elements like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, neon, etc. And also, if you have very good uh, high spectral resolution, you can analyze the cinematic of the plasma. Central stars of planetary nebulae are these low intermediate mass stars that are very faint. And in the stage of post AGB to pre-white dwarf. Many properties of the faint central stars are usually analyzed through nebular characteristics. For instance, binarity of the central star in more than 50 objects has been detected through the analysis of planetaries. Nucleosynthesis of the central stars is analyzed with the uh, chemistry of planetary nebulae for instance, the alpha elements like oxygen, neon, argon, and sulfur are supposedly unchanged by stellar nucleosynthesis, while helium, nitrogen, carbon provide information of the nucleosynthesis as these elements are produced by the stars and brought to the surface during the different rage up events. Also, the initial final mass relation in these stars, which is fundamental for stellar physics, can be found by, by nebular analysis, uh, comparing the evolution models, the stellar evolution models from the main sequence through, through the white dwarf cooling track can provide the initial masses of the stars. I'm going to show you now one work we have uh, and the results we have obtained here in Mexico in collaboration with 
Lilian Hernandez Martinez, Leticia Cariri, and myself, we use planetary nebulae as constraints for chemical evolution model in the galaxy AGC 6822, which is an irregular galaxy. We, we, we built a model tailored to match the oxygen abundance in H2 regions in these galaxies. In this uh, graph here, we are showing the behavior or the evolution of the oxygen abundance with time, the carbon to oxygen abundance with time, the nitrogen to oxygen abundance, and the neon. And in the right hand, the argon, sulfur to oxygen, chlorine to oxygen, and iron to oxygen. Uh, the dot, the big dot in here, represents the A2 regions, the value of oxygen in the A2 regions in the galaxy, and the uh, black squares and the black squares are, and also the, the triangle here, the triangle here and the black squares are the planetary nebula. And we can see that in this model, we wash Tyler to match oxygen for H2 regions, and it is based on lambda cold dark matter cosmology and star formation history increasing and bursting in time. We obtain good prediction, great prediction for most elements except carbon to oxygen and nitrogen to oxygen. So there is a problem in the chemical evolution models with for galaxies with these elements. A problem is a problem with the genes of the elements. Uh, from this type of models, we deduce that the chemical history in NGC 6822 is that an important gas mass loss occurs at the first five gigard years of existence of the galaxy. Also that no star more massive than 40 solar masses was formed in this, in this galaxy and that 0.5% of all three to 15 solar masses stars become binary system progenitors of supernova type 1A. Okay, another work Another work we developed was to analyze the chemistry of planetary nebulae, trying to compare or trying to test the AGV nucleosynthesis and to compare our results, our observations with the stellar evolution models for the stars. In these graphs here, we are presenting the log of nitrogen to oxygen versus the log of helium or the abundance of helium in this object. And in the right hand, we have the log of nitrogen to oxygen versus the oxygen abundance in these regions. In red, we have the A2 regions in this galaxy. Again, it's NGC 6822. In red, you can see the behavior of the nitrogen to oxygen with the helium in this galaxy. The same in the other uh, graph. In red, we have the nitrogen abundance versus the oxygen abundance for the, the H2 regions in this galaxy. And in black, all the points in black represents the planetary nebulae we analyze in this galaxy, in this galaxy. And we have included here some stellar evolution models, works by Caracas and Fishlock, uh, where the, the, um, the abundances predicted by these models for different metallicities. Now in blue, we have a metallicity C equal a 0 0.0001 and in uh, magenta, we have the models for metallicity 0.004 and the prediction for different 
initial masses of the central stars. Uh, what are our results? Compared to H2 regions, planetary nebulae are, all of them, helium and nitrogen rich. All these objects here are very helium rich and all above here are very nitrogen rich. In the case of the comparison with oxygen, we found that uh, we have planetary nebulas with that rich than the uh, uh, H2 regions or poor, poorer than L2 regions in the case of oxygen. But compared to helium and nitrogen, all the planetaries are helium and nitrogen rich. That is indicating that the central stars are providing helium and nitrogen to the interstellar medium due to uh, some nucleosynthesis uh, phenomena like the first and second Rejab events during the AGB phase. We note also that extreme nitrogen enrichment, extreme nitrogen enrichment occurs for stars with masses larger than three solar masses, initial masses larger than three solar masses, and that is due to hot bottom burn. Uh, in our comparison with the stellar evolution models, we found that the models do not reproduce the helium enrichment, do not reproduce the helium enrichment in the planetaries, and they don't reproduce either neon abundances that we are not showing here, but it's a result of our work. Now I'm going to talk about the metallicity gradient in these galaxies. And since long ago it is known that the disk of galaxies present chemical inhomogeneities. Many authors and ha have shown that a negative chemical gradient exists in the disk of most of spirals. The chemical abundance of heavy elements like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, etc., decrease with the galactocentric with the galactocentric distance. Lower heavy element abundances are found at larger galactocentric distances, and this has been interpreted as a result of chemical evolution in galaxies and chemical evolution in the disk of galaxies, which is not the same everywhere. So we have analyzed the metallicity gradients in these galaxies based on planetary nebulae and H2 regions. Uh, the, the gradients found in the, in the past has been, uh, has been found working with H2 regions exclusively. So we need, we want to analyze the chemical gradients because they are useful to analyze the evolution of galaxies, the chemical evolution of the galaxy. Uh, we would like to know, we need to know if the gradients that are found presently in most of the, these galaxies have evolved with time. We would like to know if the gradients or does the gradient become flatter or steepen with time? This is a question, an open question regarding the gradients in these galaxies. This can be studied analyzing the gradients with objects of different ages, okay? Planetary nebulae in particular are objects of some years old, not very, very old, but much older than H2 regions, and they could provide information about the evolution of gradients in the disk. And as a result of our work, we analyzed the chemical gradients for oxygen, neon, and argon in the Milky Way, including, including uh, planetary nebulae 
and H2 regions. The data for planetary nebulae were taken from works by Quitter, Henry, and Balik, and the data for H2 region comes from Stevan et al. In this graph, we are showing the gradients as provided by planetary nebulae and by H2 regions. In red, the line in red, mark the gradient of H2 regions. And the black dot show the gradient of planetary nebulae. In this case, in the first view of oxygen as a function of the uh, distance to the galactic center. And what we see is that the gradients of planetary nebulae are flatter and goes above the gradient of H2 regions. The same, the same happened for neon. In the middle, we have neon, the gradient of neon versus the distance to the galactic center. In red, the gradient of these regions, the black dots are the gradient from planetary nebulae. Again, the gradients of planetary nebulae is flatter than the gradient of these two regions and goes above, which is quite interesting. Planetary nebulae seems to, to be oxygen richer a new richer than H2 regions, which is really exotic or strange. And in the case of argon, we have this for argon. In this case, we have really no important difference. Although the gradients for planetary nebulae are flatter, flatter than the gradients provided by the H2 regions. Uh, if we go back to the oxygen, we can see that at the distance of the sun to the galactic center, more or less here, planetary nebulae presents larger oxygen and neon than A2 regions. This is a point that need, needs to be made clear. We analyze it other we analyzed other galaxies. We analyzed M31, Andromeda. Here we are presenting the gradients in Andromeda. Oxygen versus the galactocentric distance. Again in red is the behavior of the gradient from H2 regions. And in black, we have the behavior of planetary nebulae. In the other graph, we have the case of NGC 300. In red, the H2 regions. In black, the planetary nebulae. In both cases, the gradients from planetary nebulae are flatter than H2 regions for both galaxies. Actually, M31 is an extreme case. You can see the abundances of planetary nebulae in this galaxy are independent of the galactocentric distance. The planetary nebulae show no gradients in oxygen and show no gradient in argon and neon. I'm not showing the case of argon and neon here, but we analyze it. So the planetary nebulae anywhere in M31 seems to have the same, the same abundances and no gradient is present for planetary nebulae. This is a case that is very strange. Always planetary nebulae show some gradients in other galaxies, although that gradient is always flatter 
than the gradient shown by, by the H2 regions, as in the case of NGC 300. The gradient of planetary nebulae for oxygen is flat, and is also flatter if you use other elements like neon or argon. The reasons of why in Andromeda, M31, the planetaries show no gradient with the galactocentric distance is not, uh, the reasons are not very clear. Migration of planetaries in the disk could be one of the reasons. Actually, migration can, in some way, uh, reproduce or say that uh, why the gradients in planetary nebulae are flatter than H2 regions. Planetary nebulae are older objects and they have had time to migrate in the disk and that will make the gradient flat. The case of Andromeda is extreme and not, not migration only does not explain this extreme behavior and it's very probably that the flatterness or the, the, the fact that planetary nebulae show no gradient in Andromeda could be also due to interactions and merging with other galaxies and that all the planetary nebulae population in Andromeda could be a mixture of objects of different galaxies or are being produced by interactions with other, with other galaxies. Okay, so I go to the conclusions. I was, uh, I, I was very fast. I have presented some interesting results obtained by me and collaborators about planetary nebulae. Planetary nebulae have been used for, by us to constrain chemical evolution models of a couple of irregular galaxies. And here I presented the case of NGC 6822, where the population of planetary nebulae, which are some, are, some of them are old and some are young, the population analyzed by us helped to derive a model, a chemical evolution model for this galaxy. Uh, planetary nebulae have been used to compare their chemistry with the predictions of stellar evolution models of low intermediate mass stars. And we found that models do not reproduce some of the elements we found in planetary nebulae like helium or neon. So models need to be revised. And we use planetary nebulae in uh, the Milky Way, in Andromeda, and in GC300 to analyze their chemical gradients in comparison with the gradient found from in two regions. And we found that planetary nebulae gradients are always flatter and th th than the gradient of in two regions. And the most extreme case is M31, where the planetary nebulae gradient is zero, showing that the abundances of planetary nebulae are independent of the distance to the center of the galaxy. And migration and mergings are possible causes for this result. And that's it. The end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your wonderful presentation. So if anyone have any questions or comments, you can please go ahead and ask Professor Miriam. Uh, excuse me, may I ask a question? May I ask a question? Yes, yes, Professor. Oh, okay, okay. So thank you for this presentation about gradients. I'm going to speak about this tomorrow too. But okay. my question, yes, my question is about um, overabundance of carbon you showed us and uh, overabundance of nitrogen and how you uh, can reconcile these two facts. Because overabundance of carbon uh, it's from a triple alpha reactions and then dredge up, okay. But uh, overabundance of nitrogen from incomplete CNO cycle where carbon should be exhausted, but they, are, they both are overabundant. 
uh, yes, that is true. They are both overabundant. And of course, carbon is produced by nucleosynthesis in the star. Okay, and go to Drift the source of the job. And nitrogen is produced also, okay, nitrogen is produced of carbon, <laughs> from carbon. Yes, see inside, and, see no cycle, yeah, incomplete. You know, see no cycle. But not, yeah. the, not all the carbon is exhausted, no? If you take the, okay, a lot of carbon is produced in the nucleus of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the star. A lot of carbon is produced and some of, those, uh, some of this carbon is used to build nitrogen through mm -hmm. hot bottom burning. And this is in the surface of the mm -hmm. nucleus. Not all the nucleus, <laughs> not all the nucleus. Yeah. So it, it is Earth. enough for this carbon to be oh, overabundant yeah. into, to make overabundant nitrogen. Of nitrogen, yes. Even in the case of uh, stars with masses larger than three solar masses that produce a lot, a lot of ni nitrogen, some of them are also carbon rich. Okay, thank you.